I got to a point where, because I'd been there for probably so long, I'd said to Dad, look, if you want to go, you can go. He was at peace at that point in time in terms of that, giving him the medication and, and painkillers and stuff like that. So he was, you know, in a comfortable position. Whether or not he could hear me or not, I'm not sure. Welcome to Don't Be Caught Dead, a podcast encouraging open conversations about dying and the death of a loved one. I'm your host, Catherine Ashton, founder of Critical Info, and I'm helping to bring your stories of death back to life. Because while you may not be ready to die, at least you can be prepared. Don't Be Caught Dead acknowledges the lands of the Kulin Nations and recognises their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and First Nation peoples around the globe. James Robinson grew up in Frankston, Victoria with his mum Helen, dad Ken and brother Michael in what he describes a very loving and connected family. James has really wonderful memories growing up as a child. He now lives in Tyre, Victoria. James is married to Kirsten and is a super busy dad with their two energetic boys, Jet age nine and Phoenix age seven. James says he has a great job working for Bore Bore Shire Council. He gets great enjoyment staying fit and pottering around the garden. In the late 1990s, unfortunately, James's brother Michael, who was about to turn 21, died by suicide. James's mum Helen died unexpectedly as a result of a stroke in 2019, and his dad Ken died of cancer in 2021. Life has changed a lot for James following the death of his mum and dad in such quick succession, or from out of the blue, as James describes it. This is James's story. Thanks for joining us today, James. No problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Can you um, please tell me about a time someone close to you died? Uh, yes, a few examples in my life, uh, unfortunately. So my brother passed away when I was 18. He was 20, so over, gee, over 20 odd years ago now. So a long time ago, it feels like it. So that was probably my first experience of, a, I guess, an immediate family member. Had a few grandma and grandpas pass away as well over the period of time. But yes, yeah, certainly my brother was a, uh, a huge impact at that point in time and then in 2019 mum passed away from a stroke so she had a stroke and then four weeks later passed away so that was quite significant she was you know super fit and healthy and then two years after that a little bit over two years after that uh, dad passed away so that was 2021 dad passed away from multiple myeloma so a rare uh, blood cancer, bone marrow type of cancer. So, yeah, certainly all three, probably apart from dad, given we knew his diagnosis uh, a couple of years prior, but certainly all three, you know, not planned, <laughs> not not something that I'd ever you know, planned or thought of in terms of losing a, a brother or a, a parent. So, yeah, my brother took his own life, unfortunately, Fit, healthy, young man, good job, good mates, great family. We're a really tight, close family. So, yeah, huge shock for everybody, for for us, for friends, you know, not into drugs, not into alcohol, lived a really good good life, close mates. And, yeah, just, um, yeah, took, took his own life uh, a couple of weeks before his 21st birthday. So, yeah, I was 18 at the time, just left a note saying he loved us and... That was it. So it was it was a really hard one to, to grapple. Look, I probably oh look, oh, look, I was only eighteen, so to to process it for me, you know, completely different as to how I would process it now, being a forty three year old man with a couple of kids myself and a and a and a wife. So you know, I really I have a lot of 
memory loss I feel from that period of time you know beyond that as well so you know life just continues and, and away you go and suicide wasn't something that was you know probably well, I guess known about or, or really understood there wasn't probably the, the research and probably more the openness now that uh, it, it's talked about so you know I look when I think about it now and I look back at it I really felt for my parents you know trying to go through that period of time losing you know their, their eldest son to, to suicide you know and with no real reason as to why you know he went down that path so I, I yeah you know, the, the, you always go through the the whys and what ifs, but I know for for me, oh look, I probably continued my life. You know, as a young man, eighteen, I, I don't feel like I changed anything, which is hard when I think about it now. I think that's probably you know not not the right thing to do. So yeah, you know, when I when I think about it now, you know, but feel so sad for mum and dad and I know they really carried it right up until their passing you know they just didn't understand the why so that was it that was a you know the first real um loss of someone um super close I was really close with my brother so um what was his name James uh, Michael Michael Robinson yeah yeah and and so it was just you and Michael yeah just the two of us yeah so that you know yeah, changes the way you know you become an only child, and um, again, not that I felt like I changed the way I went about my next, you know, ten fifteen years. Oh, I don't know. I, 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 I probably dealt with it more around drinking. I think as a as a young man, so I feel like that was probably a way in which I dealt with my emotions you know young young men you know put your emotions out very often or not that you're told not to but there's that bit of stigma around that so yeah i'll probably hit it away you know i think i've dealt with it over time but but probably still haven't dealt with it it's a funny one when i think about it yeah tough you know a a tough period for mum and dad but i certainly think i don't know me being an 18 year old i probably shuffled it to the side and moved on with being an 18 year old you know back in the you know back in the late 90s early 20s and and just got on with things and was there any support offered at all that you could recall it was funny thinking about it given you and I having discussions over the last few months no god I like I remember my main memory of support is I remember I can't I can't remember if it was the police at the point in time of them saying we had found your son or your, or your brother, you know after they'd arrived at the house. I I vaguely remember them saying there's some counselling you can get through uh, through the police or, or some support. So I remember that was offered, but we didn't do anything as a family. Um, unit that I recall mum and dad ended up being heavily into meditation I think that's the way they dealt with it into the years you know into it just became part of their you know their sort of life each day that they'd, they'd sort of meditate and I think that probably that helped them get through but no like and I think just the whole suicide sort of thing and loss around that not much support I, I certainly didn't reach out or, or ask or, or request it and nor was I offered it but I never thought that I needed it probably until later in life you know looking back but uh, yeah nothing that I can recall in that in that space um, and it, you were 18 at the time mm-hmm. were you were you still at school or had you gone to university yeah I was between I'd finished year 12 I'd worked for a period of time and then I was I'd stopped working and was moving to go into university so you know I traveled for a little bit after that actually as well which I, I you know in hindsight I think you know why did I do that at that point in time why didn't I in that that year that followed he had passed away in late late Jan and then I think later on that year towards the end of that year I traveled a little bit not for long periods of time but yeah like I said I sort of just continued with my life and I I, and I look back at it now I think geez I wish I 
you know, put my arms around mum and dad a little bit more because God knows what, what they were going through. I know dad would love his garage, but I, I remember him distinctly being down there more often and I remember him crying and I can remember hearing him yelling, but to himself in the garage. I think that was his uh, space to to deal with what he was thinking with. Yeah, a funny one. And your mum? Do you remember how she dealt with it? Talking openly about death and grief can sometimes be triggering. If you find you need support, please reach out to our support services and the bereavement organisations listed on our resource hub. All links are in the show notes of this episode. Uh, look, not not. I don't have great memories around that sort of initial period. I know the family were very supportive. We had a great extended family with cousins and aunties and uncles. You know, really interconnected and uh, really valued our family time. So I know that they were certainly, you know, close with us and I think with mum and dad, um, you know, probably really helped in that space. But not that I can remember it super clearly, you know. But I think at the same time they were very, you know, how, how do we, you know, how do you deal with death and probably death in that way as well and how do we support, you know, mum and mum and dad and myself. And, you know, I have this really clear memory of I think it was after the funeral, me sitting in my bedroom and my auntie coming in and the only thing she could say to me, and not, it's not her fault but I have such a clear memory of it, was, oh, you, don't, you haven't made your bed properly and oh, this is how we do the corners and and I sort of just look, looked at her and, you know, and she just did the bed and, and then just said, I'll leave you be. And, and, you know, I have that such a clear image of her doing that and I think she was just, unaware of how to support somebody and how do you you know so it was such a shock it was such a shock so I think it really you know people really struggled with with that but I know I certainly know the family were there and and were involved with mum and dad and I think mum in for mum to deal with it in her you know years to come 10 15 years later she often because we often talked about him you know, we we're very open in that space, which I think really helped. I do think it probably frustrated Dad a little bit at times, but I know Mum, my brother was sick for a period of time. He had encephalitis and was hospitalised and in the ICU, and it was might have been around the twelve months after that episode when he took his life. And there was some research that Mum had found because I think Mum was trying to close the book and have a reason as to why he'd taken his life. I think they, she really struggled with that, um, understandably. So I think she, yeah, I think there was some research or something that can affect the brain and the chemicals, and, and I think she felt he wasn't the same after that illness. I can't remember a change. I felt he was a pretty typical, you know, 19, 20-year-old, slept in, you know, all the dead good mates, you know, had a few beers, but not much, but was in the cars and, you know, mountain bike riding, all this sort of stuff. But she sort of hung her hat on that was, you know, that changed the direction for him and resulted in this. So I think that's how mum dealt with it. I think she sort of needed closure on the, you know, that why. You know, but that was 15, 20 odd years later, you know, that, but she would often come back to that. So, and I, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. Could could be, yeah. But yeah, I think that's that's how Mum probably tried to to manage that why for herself. Hmm. And now you have two boys yourself. And and is there sort of things that you used to do as a, a child with, you know, Michael that you you mentioned my, motorbike, uh, not motorbike riding, mountain yeah, bike riding? Yeah, mountain bike riding. Yeah, look, definitely. Oh, look, I've got a couple of mad mates who love mountain bike riding and I've since got into it the last handful of years. But, yeah, it's definitely the eldest jet is 
is a keen mountain bike rider. So he he and I are doing a you know a heap of rides, which is great fun. But it's funny, my dad's dad's a you know he's an engineering draftsman. He was a mechanic. He raced motorbikes. You know he's basically born on two wheels and. Uh, my brother sort of followed in his in dad's footsteps. Michael was a motor mechanic, so that you know, I'm you know, I look at an engine and where do you start? <laughs> Call the mechanic for me. Oh, you know, I didn't get that side of things, but Michael certainly got dad's genes in terms of being a mechanic, and he was a mechanic at the point in when he when he passed and and was into rally car driving. And but Michael was also into mountain bike riding too, but. Jet has certainly got the mechanical brain as well, so I think yeah, that sort of stayed in you know in. But he, oh yeah, he's constructing bits and pieces and all that sort of stuff. And I reckon he'll be very mechanically minded. He loves unpicking how things work, so that feels nice. So that's stayed in the family a little bit. But yeah, certainly the mountain bike riding is is lovely, and I've got a few nice photos of my brother racing in in mountain bike. And it's yeah, nice reflection to you know to have a nice memory to have. And if Jet sticks with it, you know that's yeah, that's that's great for you know for his future and a nice touch back to back to Michael. So yeah, it's good. It's good. And now moving to your mum when she died, that was in two thousand and uh, nineteen. Yeah, middle of two thousand and nineteen. Yeah, look at uh, uh, we purchased this. I mean going back a little bit before then we uh, myself and Kirsten my wife we fell in love with this property in Tyab showed it to mum and dad there was two houses before you knew it we were you know putting this offer in on this house you know beautiful beautiful property and you know the, with this vision of mum and dad being next door you know us being in one house them in in the other house and you know being there for 20 odd years growing up with the boys and that interaction and you know grandma and grandpa on the on the doorstep so that was a you know something that had occurred prior to mum having the stroke so we were there for about two years with them you know with us and with them and you know it was just this lovely relationship this lovely property that sort of brought us together you not something that we'd ever planned or thought of you know moving in with your you know your parents and Kirsten's in-laws but you know mum had this really special connection with the boys you know a real grandma and would wrap her arms around them all the time and 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 them with her this beautiful connection and Jet had with grandpa as well and Phoenix was only young we moved in there when he might have been just getting into a toddler and yeah look mum you know beautiful sunny day she's out in the veggie patch remember having a chat with her and her and dad had a a dinner and dance, I think, with the local men's shed at that point in time that evening. And, yeah, you know, mum's fit and healthy, you know, 72-odd-year-old and, uh, you know, probably 15, 20 years of life ahead of her. And the, at the start of that year, uh, going back again at the start of that year, dad had just got diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So dad fit and healthy, rode motorbikes still, you know, right up until six months before he passed, he was still riding, rode push bikes. Yeah, both of them in just, you know, what, what you'd hope to be, you know, health-wise, you know, in your early 70s. Um, and, yeah, look, they went out for dinner and, and next thing, you know, mum's got a headache and um, dad recognised that part of her, um, her left side um, within sort of, 20 minutes of her saying, I think I've got to go home. And then her headache getting worse, dad noticed getting into the car, she couldn't lift her left leg. So the, it was a hemor- hemorrhagical stroke type of stroke, and that's how you pronounce it. Uh, but yeah, very super heavy, instant bleeding, uh, pretty hard to come back from in terms of recovery. So, you know, within, she was straight down to Frankston Hospital and they sent her straight up to the, the Alfred but yeah, by the time you know, I followed them in, and by the time you know she was, uh, uh, we could see her, which was only a handful of hours. She couldn't open her eyes. She was, you know, she was chatting, but definitely slowing down pretty quick in that space. And within a day or two days, um, she was only squeezing your hand, uh, so she could hear, but she couldn't talk. Um, yeah, and that passed within. Oh, gee, it would have been two, you know, maybe at the two-week mark um, she couldn't respond. So, yeah, super um, super tough to see, you know, that 
just that change so quick from here yeah, being a, a you know a super super healthy fit you know person to just instantly you know almost instantly just near yeah, life changing and yeah that sort of two to three week period you know the scans were just showing that the bleed was too heavy um, the impacts on the brain were too heavy so you, you yeah was just take her off the life support and and see how long she lasts and that so that was four four weeks from a stroke to to her passing so yeah super shock and you know with that I guess in the background for me it was you know a horrific unexpected uh death of mum but also knowing that six months prior dad had been diagnosed with you know multiple myeloma and there was that journey to come so you sort of think okay well We'd sort of planned a little bit that, well, gee, it's great that they're next door, mum and dad are next door, we can support mum to support dad throughout whatever, you know, journey he's going to take with the, with the myeloma cancer and then and dad had held off on chemo because his protein levels that sort of indicate how bad the myeloma might be um, within the system were quite low so they wanted to hold off on on any chemo or form of treatment so he had a good six months of no treatment it was just monitoring and then it was would have been two weeks um, prior to mum's stroke that the doctors had said oh look your levels are going up we probably better start the chemo yeah and then mum's stroke occurred you know within the week of mum's stroke Dad's doctors were saying, look, we probably should get onto the, the chemo sooner rather than later. Mum's death and, and dad had said, I'm not doing anything until, you know, we, you know, we sort of work through uh, mum's funeral and, and passing. And But, yeah, look, would have been after mum's funeral, the maybe five to seven days after mum's funeral, dad was in with his first round of chemo. So... You know, for dad to he had this whole other journey to focus on. So, you know, he's grieving the loss of, you know, his wife of 45 odd years, whatever it might be. Yeah, so a bloody shit period. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and tell me, do you recall that decision-making process where were you involved in that where you had to decide to take off the life support from your mum? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Look, you know, it was a, it was a whirlwind, to be honest, just given the severity of the stroke, these, you know, and the way in which mum deteriorated, you kind of knew that, she, you know, there's no chance that she's going to come back. So I, I feel like I probably came to terms with you know she's not going to talk like we we spoke about that you know there was there was certainly talk about okay what recovery might look like but within the following week it was it was talk about look, we don't think she'll make a recovery so yeah look we we were certainly you know, was both myself and dad I guess supporting each other in in the decisions that that we had to make, but yeah, you know, there were no options. You know, there were you know, mum had the stroke had, and the impact on the brain was so significant that yeah, there was no there was no chance of recovery. It, it was yeah, you know, yes, you could we could have kept her on life support, but there was there was no. There was no benefit to anyone in that space. And I know probably, you know, conversations with mum and dad over the years, you know, they were never, you know, fond of, hey, keep me around just because, I guess. And and if I, you know, if I'm not speaking or talking or I don't have that ability to have a, a quality of life... I don't want to be here. So, you know, you can make that decision. Not that I don't think it was ever written down anywhere, but we often touched on it every now and again if we, it was often on the back of conversations around my brother passing, you know, when you'd move into that space. So, yeah, I guess it was a, 
an easy decision given the state mum was in that, you know, there was no quality of life for her. So let's let's take her off the life support and just let, let the days and let her body manage it. Oh, mate, can't remember off the top of my head how, how long it was. Unfortunately, we were both home, which I kind of regret. You know, mum was in in hospital in the city and dad and I had come home with the plan to go up the next morning and I oh, it might have been 4 or 5 a.m. I think dad had got the call that, yeah, she'd passed. So I really feel sad about that. I sort of kick myself a bit that, that no one was there when mum had passed. You know, it, I'm not religious or anything like that. I don't have, you know, but I do, yeah, I do feel sad that she passed without someone sitting with her, holding her hand. I sort of regret that element of mum passing, but, yeah. Did COVID play a part in that at all, James, given no, the time period? No, that was, that was just prior to, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, Dad, you know, he got... And it's funny, actually, going back to back to mum, kind of glad she wasn't here for COVID. You know, I, th- I don't think she would have coped very well at all. But, like, yeah, look, Dad... Dad had the impacts of COVID, unfortunately. You know, A, lost his wife, um, you know, 2019. Started chemo at the back end of 2019 and then, you know, COVID hits 2020 and, you know, he's grieving, couldn't see me, you know, got to protect himself because of the impacts of chemo and the immune system being down. So he really locked himself, you know, I don't, regret he like he had to do that but it's funny curse and i often speak about it and i wish you know if you you know if you think about dad's journey through that period of time you know i didn't see him for periods kirsten didn't the boys certainly didn't see him the way they would have um because he really tried to protect himself which is completely understandable but if we hadn't known that he only had that period of time. Geez, I wish we were over there more often, you know. And I think he would have opened the doors more. But, yeah, look, he was, you know, his, his health and immune system really compromised with the chemo and, and he did. He had to protect himself from, you know, from getting COVID because it probably would have, probably would have, you know, really impacted on him. He had, he'd had mild emphysema over the journey as well, so... Yeah, he really had to lock himself away. But, yeah, what a shit time when, you know, he's, he's grieving his, his wife, he's doing chemo, you know, we're next door. I mean, obviously I saw him as much as I could, but friends and family, you know, few and far between during that during that period. So, yeah, I feel super sorry for, for Dad, you know, in that, when I think about it, him in that moment. Um, yeah, I mean, but... Obviously, again, you know, you, we didn't know was he going to be around for two years, five years, ten years. I think the average life expectancy for multiple myeloma at that point in time was around five year sort of mark. Yeah, dad, two and a half years in when he passed around that time. So you know, he didn't even make you know the, the, the sort of five year mark. But but yeah, we went through all the three sort of publicly available treatments chemo treatments he'd often have a really good response initially which was great but then six to eight months later the multiple myeloma would would evolve and change and and that chemo drug wouldn't work so we'd have to change it by the time we got through the third you know year and a half in or so it was well alternate you know awesome uh some medications that were more on the trial he had to get into a trial so yeah unfortunately he got pneumonia his immune system was pretty shot right at the back end start of 2022 yeah 2022 so we went up to the alfred to try and get in on a trial drug but his body was just too weak at that point in time and the doctor said look you try and get fit healthy and then come back but he, he was really on a downward journey from that point onwards and he had a few uh, you know issues with you know almost passing but you know some heavy antibiotics got him through and which was kind of 
great because we got to this point where he made the decision, you know, probably jumping a, a little bit, but Dad actually himself got to make the decision that yeah, I've had enough, I don't want any more treatment. There's no other treatment options for me and his body just couldn't recover from the state that it was currently in. So we were in peninsula, in and out of Peninsula Private a lot in that last, you know, sort of probably four odd months. And yeah, look, he, he got to say, hey, I think I'm done, you know, which I'm glad about. I'm you know, probably happy I didn't have to make the decision, you know. But we spoke about it, you know, the, the days prior. You know, he thought, oh, I don't think I can do it anymore. And, you know, I was supportive of him in that space. And you, know, you could see he probably wasn't going to come out of or, or recover any better than to try a trial. You know, it was just, you know, the antibiotics that he was on was just sort of holding him at that point in time. So, so yeah, yeah he's made that decision himself, which I'm kind of glad he... I'm sort of happy for him that he got to say, yeah, look, I've had enough. And so we got that opportunity to bring friends and family in, which was really lovely. And we were at a point in COVID where we were a bit more open and free. We were back out and about a little bit. And the, and the hospital were great. And they said, hey, just bring people in, no, no problem at all. So that was really lovely. And he had a heap of friends and family come. And I think he was in and out of probably you know, knowing who was there and that, but, you know, people sat with him for hours and had chats and that, which was really lovely and just gave people an opportunity to say goodbye, you know, which was which was really nice. Because he did, we, we didn't know is he how his body would just sort of hold on and, and sort of sustain him, I guess, and, you know, how, you know, how long he'd be able to, I guess, take in who was there and who was around him. So it was nice that we had a bit of, time before he got to that point of uh yeah he was he was you know more asleep and just uh, his body was just going through the motions at that back end so that was lovely I'm, I'm glad that friends and family and, and i'm glad for dad that he had the opportunity to say goodbye and hear people and have people you know uh, with him so yeah that was that was sort of dad's you know dad's journey and were you there when he died yeah. Something that you hadn't been able to do with your mum. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it probably is funny. I was, you know, because you're in and out of in and out of hospital a fair bit, and I stayed the night a couple of times because you know I was thinking, oh, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to be there or at least within the vicinity. Uh, pretty hard to sleep on the old hospital chair, so the the nurses. There was a couple of spare rooms, which I don't think that meant to, but I slept on a bloody on a bed out to the side. But then, yeah, it's funny. The one night, I was just a bit cooked, and I thought, I think I've got to go home. And, and look, I debated it, not debated it, but I I discussed it with Curse and uh, do I come home? Yeah, because just around the corner, so not far away. But I'm like, shit, I. What if he passes? And then, yeah, I was reflecting on mum and stuff like that. But I, I actually did. I got to a point where, because I'd been there for probably so long, I'd said to dad, look, if you want to go, you can go. I've got, you know, I've got to go home and get some sleep, which I can laugh about now. But, you know, I was, I'd probably thought about it enough where I was comfortable to go and I think okay go back to sleep because how you know I knew I was going to be back in the next day and how long do you do this cycle for so I did yeah look I I I went home you know he dad was yeah he was at peace at that point in times in terms of you know that giving him the medication and and painkillers and stuff like that so he was in a in a comfortable position whether or not he could hear me or not, I'm not sure. But he was you know, non-responsive, but but breathing on his own, just in bed. And he had been for a handful of days in that sort of state. So, yeah, look, I said goodbye and went home and then, yeah, came back the next day. And so I was quite relieved that I'd slept, no phone calls. I'd woken up, had something to eat. Okay, I'll go in. And so, whatever, you know, pretty, not early, but I was like, sort of keen to get back 
obviously to be be by his side again and yeah got there and opened up the blind and said g'day you know put on the the morning news or to be a little bit of a routine i was in for him and just chat to him and talk about you know what was going on and it would have been 15 20 minutes and the nurse popped in and said you know g'day um and well, i would have been within three four minutes of her popping in yeah maybe i was there for 20 minutes and he stopped breathing you know and so it was this you know i was holding his hand and we we're just chatting had the news on and you know brief chat and the nurse just looked at me and she just cried and she said you know he waited for you you know because they yeah, they were wonderful and they knew that oh look i've got to go home and all that sort of stuff so i guess they they knew the sort of you know the background and and they were very like they knew because dad had been in and out of peninsula private for geez you know two two years two and a half years so they knew him really well and you know he'd made some really lovely connections with the with the nurses in there and and they knew his background they knew me and that and and yeah look he it did feel like he'd he'd waited you know for for me which was yeah they do say that hearing is the last sense to go yeah okay yeah so it was yeah definitely you know it was just nice to have walked in and said good morning and and yeah look whether or not he could hear me i don't know but but if he could that's you know lovely and yeah holding his hand and then him you know just just sort of stopping he was super peaceful you know i Obviously, you, you, you know, you, you cry at that point in time. and But I was happy as well, you know, that AI was there. But, yeah, he did just stop. It was very peaceful, you know. The nurse was great. You know, she, she left and, you know, you have, your, you have your time there, you know, sitting, you know, sitting with him and, yeah, you get to say goodbye. So I was, you know, I, was, I felt... Yeah, I felt pretty blessed that I was there, you know, that that, that he did pass at that point. Because I probably, yeah, even though I'd said goodbye and went home, I'd, I still would have kicked myself if he had a pass and I wasn't there. So, yeah, look, it was, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really comfortable with Dad passing in that moment and, and, yeah, I guess I'm at peace with it more so because I know I was there, you know, and, and yeah, maybe he heard me. <laughs> Uh, which is which is nice nice to know or nice to yeah just yeah it's a bit of, it's an easier way to I guess close you know, close off on someone passing given given you were there and you you've got that opportunity right at that point in time just to say goodbye you know yeah and how long did you sit with him for uh gee look Maybe it was, maybe it was only half an hour. It was funny, yeah. Like I, I do, you know. Even going into, even my brother as well. I mean, Mum. Once we got in and and saw her, felt a little bit disconnected. I don't know. It's a funny. It's a hard. It's a funny thing to think of. You know, it's like she's already left. So what I was seeing, yeah, it was mum, but it, it sort of wasn't mum. So I, I didn't stay with mum that long, 10, 15 minutes. My brother, we had to obviously identify, which was which was pretty tough. But, you know, again, that was – I didn't feel like I had the need to uh, – yeah, with mum to stay. And same with my brother, even though – yeah, that was the coroner's in, in Melbourne. Yeah, that was minutes. I think I looked at him and walked out. <laughs> Did you have to identify his body, James? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. That was just part of a, yeah, just, just part of the process. Yeah, because he was found where he'd taken his life and then, you know, cause of death and things like that has to go go through. So he was in Melbourne when we first saw him. Yeah, and yeah, mum didn't want to, she didn't want to go in and see him and uh, dad and I did, but yeah, 
I'm kind of glad I did, but I don't feel like I needed to, you know, reflecting on it. Yeah, so with Dad, yeah, look, oh, again, you know, I'd, I'd had weeks, I guess, preparing for Dad's passing, um, being with him, you know, for a long time. You know, when he, you know, when he was communicating and we were chatting and we were talking about it to him, you know, sort of slipping away, I guess, and then and then to passing, I felt like I'd, yeah, I guess made you, made my peace and said my goodbyes. And so I, I didn't feel like I had to stay, you know, with him for for a long period of time. It, it might have been 20 minutes, half hour that I, you know, just said goodbye again and gave him a hug and a kiss and packed up my things and, you know, packed up Dad's things that were in and around the, the room. And, yeah, look, again, the nurses were great. Um, had come in after a period. Or, no, actually, I think I went out there and said, oh, look, I'm comfortable to, to leave now. Is that okay? And, again, you know, I didn't know the next steps or, or what, you know, what to do. But at the same time, I wanted to get home to, you know, Kirsten and the boys and I'd obviously, obviously messaged Kirsten and just said, Dad's, Dad's passed and I'll see you soon. Um, so, yeah, look, I... I, I and each to their own, but for me, I'd had, had that period of time with him that I was comfortable that I didn't need to sit there or be with him for the next steps in what the hospital would do with, you know, with Dad. And, yeah, I wanted to get home to Kirsten and the boys as well and, you know, and be around them and because, yeah, you, you know that uh, you know, how old was Jed at the time, you know, seven and a five-year-old. Don't you know how they're going to gra- grapple with their emotions and all that sort of stuff, and you know, and Kirsten as well, and then to start the process of letting you know, Dad's brother know and family members and friends and that. So yeah, so I yeah, I wasn't with him for too long, but I was okay with that. And just going back to that process of you were referring how you were you were exceptionally tired, and you had obviously been sustaining this routine that you'd developed with your dad mm. uh, being at his bedside. So you mentioned that you would turn the radio on every morning. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, the TV I'd, I'd put on. I mean, I like my news anyway, but, yeah, it was, I don't know, you just sort of felt like you were keeping, you know, keeping them up to date, like I was keeping him up to date with what's going on and obviously you would talk about, yeah, I would talk about the boys and Kirsten and and family and, you know, friends who had reached out. So I guess, you you know, for me, yeah, I was treating Dad as if he was still listening and there and giving him the news of the world and, you know, our world and all that. So, yeah, like I enjoy, it's funny, like I enjoyed going into hospital and being with him, you know, I enjoyed my time with him like I you know brought the boys in and things like that but it's hard for them like they saw him at some pretty tough moments you know he lost his hair and all that sort of stuff and he lost a bit of weight you know so you as much as we wanted them to be with dad and see dad and, and dad to see the boys you know you you are aware of um how they process it or or don't process it and that exposure to you know just hospitals in general and and you know where dad was um, um at that point in time you know it, it wasn't grandpa that they knew so it was a funny one to sort of grapple with how to manage the boys but yeah look i had got into you know just that routine of of seeing dad and you know even when he was well and i was bringing in clothes and magazines and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, yeah, you, know, you just, you just roll with it, you know. You, you know, being the, being the last, the only child, and that sort of stuff. You, you know, it was, it was, it was me. You know, I, you know, family and friends offered, and I'm probably thinking about it. I'm sure I took people up on uh, on offers of help and support and. People went in to see Dad or would, would cook food, you know, for us as well, you know. So we, we did have a lot of support. But, 
you know, I did, you know, obviously, yeah, it, it was me, you know, daily in terms of you want a newspaper, do you want me to bring you a coffee, you pair of jocks, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, motorbike magazine, you always want to lose motorbike magazine. Yeah, so, you you know, you do get into a bit of a routine, you know, I guess particularly when someone's, you know, at that, that end or close to, and, and, yeah, you're the only child. And when you get to that point where you made that decision to go, I need to go home and get some sleep, at what point in time or what were the things that were going through your mind to make that decision? And I oh, suppose be comfortable with that decision. Yeah. Oh, geez, oh, when, I, when I think about it, I mean, it, I was just a bit mentally exhausted, you know, and, um, even though in, you know, I was going home for the majority of it, but the last couple of nights I'd stayed in the hospital you know it's just not your own bed and it's not with your family and you know there was probably the element of having a distraction too you know you, you walk in the door and you've got two young boys that you know it's their their life and their things and their toys and they're doing this and hey dad come and look at this so yeah putting myself back into my own uh, life probably gave me a bit of a mental break from from being with dad and being in the hospital environment and and thinking about you know, all those things. So, you know, look, I probably wasn't, you know, this is me thinking sort of back looking at it, probably a bit of self-preservation, you know, just to reset a bit, give yourself a bit of energy and a chop out because or else, yeah, you just burn yourself and then you're not, you're no good, you're no good to anyone. So, yeah, look, it was, and look, and like I said, I'd had time, you know, I knew dad was going to pass at some point in time. So I'd really been conscious of saying my goodbyes to him, you know, quite a lot in, in the, the days and the weeks leading up to him passing. So I did feel pretty comfortable with it. But, yeah, I was often – I was obviously reflecting on mum too and and that scenario, and I didn't want that to happen again. But I did – I think because I had those that, – that duration with dad and I said my goodbyes, whereas mum – I'm sure I did, but I can't. Rec- I can't visually recall it. Saying goodbye to mum, I'm sure I did. You know, m- many you know days in the hospital, and then knowing that she wasn't going to come back, I'm sure I did, but I can't. I can't picture it. So I was probably pretty mindful of telling dad what I thought and and him hearing it a lot. <laughs> But so, yeah, then the, the check out and going home was just for me. And I knew I was probably just listening to my body. I knew I was pretty exhausted and I just needed my own bed and some of that family distraction and family time to re-energise and, and, you know, come back, whether that was going to be for a day or two or a week, who, who knew at that point in time. So, yeah, but I was comfortable with it. And I think just because I'd, I'd made my peace and said goodbye and if he had passed, I, I still would have kicked myself but I probably would have, you know, been comfortable with it as well. But I suppose, as you mentioned before, the death is just one aspect of it because once someone's died, you then had to go home and explain to the boys Mm, and then ring, you know, your uncle. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, like even... Thinking about it now, I didn't, yeah, like I didn't actually have a plan in place. It's funny, you know, in terms of organising funerals, even though I knew Dad was about to pass, I hadn't even jumped to those next steps. Had you had conversations with him at all? Yeah, he spoke about being cremated. Um... What else did we talk about? We we did talk about elements of the funeral. Yeah, I think having the motorbikes there. I'm trying to trying to recall our conversations. I'm sh- I'm sure we we did have. I know we had conversations about it, but it, gee, it was right at the pointy end of Dad 
passing. Yeah, I remember I remember him saying which was which is funny for dad, but I remember him saying just out of the blue, Yeah, you know, you you'll be all right. There's there's money that'll be there for you. <laughs> which was I found that quite funny because he's not a big he was always spending money on motorbikes, but he was he was always tight in that space too. But that was a funny thing that came out right towards the back end. But we yeah, we definitely spoke about the funeral, but not not in detail, not in great detail. Tell me about the motorbikes. Oh, you know that was Dad. Yeah, born, born on two wheels, and you know we he raced and. Uh, trail bike road and all sorts of stuff over his years and he only stopped when mum had my brother and me you know back in the in the day whatever it was 60s and 70s uh you know a lot of people in the racing world and all dad's mates you know accidents often people getting killed and things like that so mum had said oh look can you pack up the racing which he did and then he went to trail bike riding so i don't know what's uh, what's worse to be honest but Oh yeah, a massive. That was his second home, Amtra Motorbike Club that he uh, part founded back in the day. Yeah, he was still riding the motorbike probably up to six months before he passed. You know, we had a a road bike that he still got out on. Yeah, which was pretty amazing for a, you know in his early seventies. And yeah, look on the you know out of all his mates, you know ride the motorbikes to the funeral and you know sort of show for the Hearst out which was which was really nice and yeah a lot of motorbike stories I mean yeah it was his life really always a couple of motorbikes in the garage growing up uh, as kids and yeah a lot of close close friends yeah so that was the motorbike you know side of things it was just that that was dad yeah that's great. And just going back to, we've touched on the support that you had uh, when Michael died. What was the difference between, you know, the support or, or lack of support that you had when, when Michael died to when your mum died or when your dad died? It's funny when I re- reflect on, you know, mum and dad passing. I mean, obviously dad, dad was there with mum, so we... You know, I really supported Dad in, you know, I guess, preparing for the the funeral and and all those elements. But there was no, you know, I know you and I have spoken about this. There was no place to go to find out. Okay, what is the first step? What is the next step? What should I think about? So it. In terms of what support was there, there was no support. Yeah, you know, the hospital asks about, you know, pretty much instantly, or oh, who's the funeral director, and I should I haven't thought about that, you know. And you're just into it. It's yeah, it's a, it's a funny, a funny thing. No one offered. Not that I can recall, no one offered Dad or I counselling when Mum passed that I can recall. And no one offered counselling, you know, when Dad passed that I can recall. Um, You were just straight into funeral preparation. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird period of time. I mean, I guess I had the benefit of mum passing so I, I knew what to expect and you know we used the same uh, funeral company as we did for mum I used for dad which was kind of comforting I think because I had already acquainted myself with them during during mum and they were wonderful and yeah look I was exposed to how you go about it with mum passing so you know sort of prepared in that space but you're not prepared at the same time either. You know, you, you are just, you know, you, you're grieving a loved one and then you're just straight into this, well, I've got to select a, you know, a location and they're going to be cremated. I've got to choose a coffin. I've got to get a funeral director. Am I doing an obituary? Am I posting on social media? 
yeah, all these things all of a sudden. And and there's the time, like there's time pressure too that you've got to do this within. So it's pretty daunting. You do just fly by to the seat of your pants. You probably make decisions. I mean, I, I, I was really happy with mum's funeral and dad's funeral, but you don't have the luxury to weigh up options. You know, you, you sort of, it's like, the funeral's just got to happen and you've just got to make decisions to keep things moving. You've got to write, you've got to ask people to to be involved in the funeral, to write speeches. You've got to get photos ready. You've got to select music. You've got to choose a coffin. You've got to choose, like, it's, it's a whirlwind of decision-making. It probably, you know, depending on the nature of the, the death and the relationship, you know, when you're at, at your lowest so it's a funny period of time I mean you know Kirsten was wonderful help in that space and obviously lent on each other and you know she's a real doer so she helped with decision making for me and selection of music and photos but it's a real tough period of time and and yeah you're making these really snap decisions you know you're not it's not like you're buying a car and you're shopping around for options and you know you've just got to move quite quickly and uh, and grieve at the same time and where do you think that that compulsion to move quickly comes from where do you where do you feel that do you think i mean I th- oh well i guess with a someone passing you know there's this time period where you know you've got to have a funeral qu- quite quickly afterwards so i think just socially you're you're driven to you know you've got aunties and uncles and other relatives straight away asking questions about oh what date will the funeral be shit i haven't even thought about it only died yesterday so yeah i guess there's just this historical social pressure that a funeral comes pretty quick after a death typically i guess so yeah you, you do you just move move pretty quick in that space which i think some people would really really struggle with i can imagine again depending on who's passed away and the nature of it and the relationship i'm sure people look back and go gee i wish i did that funeral completely different and i wish i had known x y and z and i know and i've mentioned this to you i know kirsten and i had said during you know during dad passing that gee there needs to be a one-stop shop that you can go what's next what resources oh gee i I didn't think of that. That's great that that's there. Because obviously beyond the funeral, you know, then you've got assets and you've got bank details and closures and superannuation and the ATO and, oh, there's so much. You know, I know with Dad, you know, six months later I was still, you know, trying to close a, I don't know what it was, an RACV account or something. And you just, like wow how how is this so hard or i wish i knew or why didn't someone tell me this six months ago because i could have knocked it on the head instead of dragging it and it just drags your grief grief out i guess and things you you would hope you could put to bed pretty quick and not worry about but yeah there's process processes to it um but they're not easy and they're not you don't have a guide a guide would be wonderful you know a, a and uh, yeah, and it's funny that Kirsten and I mentioned it, and then and then you got in touch. <laughs> it, it's required. It's definitely required because I think it would. It, you would just slow down, and you would be so much more aware of the process, the steps, what to think about. Yeah, I think it would help you make probably far better decisions at that point in time when yeah you're grieving and you know, a loved one. Mm. And knowing what you know now, have you done anything to prepare for your own <laughs> death? Have you done any, any end-of-life planning, no, James? No, which is terrible, isn't it? Lost three family members and I'm still not planned. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I think, yes, I should. I know I, I know I should. You know, Kirsten and I have probably touched on things over the years and, oh, look, I'm a bit bit like mum and dad like to be cremated and 
like not to be kept on life support if I've got no quality of life. You, know, you don't want to be a burden to others. And that's probably as far as I've got. Yeah, which I know is pretty, pretty terrible. Um, and what do you think has do you think has been the thing that's held you back from from being more formal with your your wishes and documenting what you choose to do? Oh, I don't know if there's uh, no, nothing's held me back. I, I, I know you know particularly with my experiences. I know I should do it, and, and we both should do it. Um, yeah, nothing's really held me back. I think it's just actually making time to do it, to to be planned. We're, we're probably more planned around the, well, if we both went, what would happen to the boys, <laughs> you know, but not so much in, you know, wills and things like that, which, again, I, I should do. I know well and truly that I should do it, but, yeah, just haven't haven't made it a priority as such. Yeah. <laughs> and given the scenarios that you've been in, how have you found when people offer their support or how can they, how can they help someone who's grieving? What have you found that has worked well when someone's come to you and offered support? For me, I guess it, for me it was more just knowing that someone was there. Yeah, I, I try, I don't know, just my nature, I probably take on things and particularly, yeah, during the death, particularly dad, I, I you know, I think I just carried uh, my own grief and in my to-do list because I felt responsible for it. But in saying that, I, I knew that there were family members there who would offer support, you know, even Kirsten, you know, being there, but, you know, and my mates as well. I knew there were people there, but I didn't feel like I actually had to lean on them to help or to help me get through either the grieving or the planning or the preparation or the doing, you know, of what to came after dad passing. But just just the knowing that they were there was enough for me. Yeah, which sounds a bit obvious that that would be, yeah. But, that yeah, I, I didn't feel like I needed to lean on people to do elements or tasks for me that then, yeah, would make things any better for me. I just probably carried myself and and what I needed to do. I think it just helped me get through it as well, knowing that I was probably in control of, you know, of everything once Dad, Dad passed. But certainly not to say that, yeah, friends and family didn't reach out a lot and, and offer their support. Um, you mentioned that there was people making meals at times. Yeah, yeah, look, definitely, you know, that uh, that was definitely wonderful, you know, and for both Kirsten and myself, yeah, knowing that you've got a a fridge full of food. Yeah, and I know we did that for Dad when Mum passed, you know. Dad's a bit of a meat and three veg guy, not much cooking going on. Mum did most of the cooking, but, uh, yeah, I know that was – that would have been a huge – Thing for dad you know a knowing that we were on the doorstep you know 50 meters from his back door but to take care of some of those really simple small things in dad's case when mum passed yeah it would have gone a long way just to relieve some pressure for dad because i knew that if we didn't cook anything he probably wouldn't be eating too much so we probably you know put ourselves in that space not that he asked for it but yeah it look it does help and it's such a simple and easy thing and not that we ever asked people for it but if they offered we didn't say no you know so yeah small things like that but you know certainly people you know were offering photos 
stories and insights, you know, for dad or, you know, I, I reached out for stories, you know, I reached out to a, to his motorbike mates to, you know, to put stories together and speak at the funeral and, you know, people were, were certainly, you know, forthcoming for that, which was, which was great. You know, it took a bit of pressure off in that space too. What would you say from your experience would be the most significant challenge that a family faces after someone dies? Look, I mean, it depends on... Oh, look, I think planning the funeral is just huge, particularly, you know, maybe in an unexpected death. There's so many... And again, it's going back to there's not a location to just go to to go, okay, what do I need to do first? What's the most important step? And then what's the next? And then what's the next? So, you know, it's bleedingly obvious, but a fu- <laughs> funeral is just... There's a hell of a lot to it. It takes a lot of time. And, you know, you're... you're you almost have this pressure that you, you a you're, you're trying to do it, do a funeral well for the person who passed, but you try almost trying to impress others because there's an audience that goes and wants to hear about the individual, and so I just yeah, it's it's a hard period of time to grieve and to plan and to do it justice for that person. I certainly found, like, I wanted to make sure that, you know, that almost all the people in Dad's life were acknowledged or that, you know, there were snippets in there for, for that individual who I knew was going to the funeral that they could go, oh, that's when we did this with Ken or whatever it might be. So that was hard. But, oh, look, for me it was probably all the stuff afterwards, Um just the life, packing up their life. Oh, yeah, from house insurance and car registrations, transferring ownership over, banks, mobile phones, finding bloody passwords. And Although, luckily, with Dad, he had a million notebooks that had all his... <laughs> email addresses, all these bank details. He had almost, when mum passed, because mum was sort of managing all that stuff, the finances and all that sort of back of house stuff in life, dad wrote it all down once mum. So whenever he found a password or a bank account or something, he wrote it down in these little journals and notebooks and they had handwritten contacts and like, you know, they'd cross them out. So they were, you know, they were so organised in that space. You know, I think I think it's just that era. So I was fortunate enough that, you know, find going through the house and, you know, you're packing up bits and pieces, but finding all these notebooks and finding all these passwords, people's contact information, bank account details, insurance details. You know, I did almost just went through dad's list. But it's 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 daunting and it takes time, you know. Six months later, you're still going, trying to close up superannuations, you know, Centrelink and ATO, oh, getting bloody reimbursements from car insurance companies. They won't just drop money into a bank account for you. It's like $40 that you don't care of. If they send you a check, but you can't bank the check because we are with ING and they don't have a face-to-face like you know these things you just don't think of so it's just a process and it's a time-consuming process like I I had this box all these two boxes of all dad's journals and a million paper statements that they had of mobile phones and bank account details I had this box that sat beside my bed for God, it would have been almost 12 months that I would just slowly go to and go through and, oh, yeah, I've got to do that, you know. So 
you know, I did a bulk of it quite quickly, but as time went on and you just, you just get a bit worn down for the process and particularly dealing with some companies and you've got this probate, you're trying to say on the, how many times you've got to say, I'm the next to kin, I'm the only child, yes, I've got this, yes, I'll send you the original, but it's not the original, it's going to be a photocopied version, you know, all these just processes and steps that legally these firms want, want you to do, it's time and energy, and it, it just, it, ta- it takes a lot of commitment to get through it. Yeah, you're packing up someone's life. Um, and how do you feel that it impacted on your grief and your ability to grieve? Oh, look, I, I kind of feel like um, I've been lucky. I, I don't know how to put it. With mum and dad living next door, um, I could take my time going through their house, going through their stuff finding stuff I didn't know existed, finding a lot of my childhood stuff. So I could wander over to their side of the property and I could just look at stuff. I could stand in the bedroom with the best intentions of packing up a wardrobe or a drawer or something, but I I really had the luxury of time you know, which I was really blessed with when I think about it because I didn't have to sell a house or rent it out or, you know, they weren't in an aged care facility that you just pack up the room and you probably got to move on because they've got another client in. So, you know, I could wander over any time. I could hang out in the garden, prune some roses and, you know, think about mum or go in the garage and just look at the endless stuff that dad had in his garage slowly sell bits and pieces that I didn't need or want or give to his motorbike mates. You know, he still had his car, still had his caravan, still had his motorbike, all these tools, you know, from yeah, dad was keeping stuff that was 50, 60 years ago, you know, when he was a kid, he still had stuff. It's amazing, which I'm so lucky that he still had I could reflect on it and give myself time to pack up their life so my grieving you know was over a long period of time but it was I felt like I had time to do it and I'm still cleaning you know we we since moved all their stuff out of that house and we used that house after a almost 12 months as an Airbnb and we've got it rented out at the moment, which I actually don't enjoy because I can't walk over there and it's it's certainly taken the shine off being at that property where we thought, I guess, mum and dad would be for 20 years and now there's somebody else in the house and I can't just walk over there and sort of sit in a space where they were. So it's changed, certainly changed uh, now, but, you know, I've got you know, a lot of mum and dad's stuff still and it's in boxes in the shed and, you know, we're thinking of moving. So I'm now sort of going back through all their stuff and probably having a bit more of a um, blunt assessment of do I need to keep this? You know, is it valuable to me? Will my boys cherish it? What does it mean? Uh, so I think, you know, you in everybody's situation will be different. You don't want to rush I think into making these decisions when you're packing up someone's life of what to keep, what not to keep. I think if you've got the beauty of time to a grieve and process it and then their physical things process and think about, you know, like I kept all dad's jackets and they're still in my wardrobe. Now I look at them two years on. I don't actually think I've got a connection to that. So I'll pass it on. You know, but maybe in in haste or in in grief, you know, straight after somebody, if you've got to make snap decisions, maybe you would make the best ones. But yeah, I feel for us, I've had ample time to grieve and come to terms 
you know, with, with mum and dad passing. And I've had this beautiful time to physically hold their things for a long time and decide what means the most to me, what doesn't. Do I need to keep it? Do I need to keep it for the boys? Can I donate it or pass it on? So, yeah, that, that certainly helped in my, in my you know, loss and, and grieving times being probably on our side in that space, yeah. And in relation to Michael, you were talking about the, the fact that you look at the place where your parents lived on the property with you and it was not the the house that, you know, you expected or for them to be there. Is there anything with Michael's death, you know, obviously it was more of a public suicide. Mm. Is there an area that you avoid now or after his death? Yeah, funny actually there's it, it was in Frankston and, and a, a development was underway where he went to and took his life. So I don't I don't go down that street. Not that I'm there or in that area often. I don't feel like I need to but same time I don't I don't want to. <laughs> it's yeah. A, it's a it's a funny one. But then, you know, like we grew up uh, all our lives at the same house in Frankston and a heap of memories, you know, in and around Frankston and I'm more than happy to, you know, to drive and I would detour to see our house. Yeah, so that's, you know, that's fine. But, yeah, certainly, you know, where he passed, I think I'd been into the into the the court once following and you know, I don't I don't need to... I don't need to to go back there or feel I want to. But then, yeah, at the same time, a street that comes off it, I don't drive down there. But I don't think, I don't feel like I need to. It's not going to help me. Uh, yeah, and that's, whatever, over 20 years ago. So, yeah, it's certainly, yeah, different. Oh, a different time, different experience, Di- you know, different age different way of passing (laughs) which just changes i guess how you how you view the the death and the passing and and your grief and yeah what you do and what you do and don't do i think everybody's gonna come at it differently with their own experience and and i think the way in which the person their loved one has passed you know you, you might get time to say goodbye you might you might not might be expected it might not be i think that's going to certainly dictate how you manage your own grief you know moving moving forward yeah like for dad i feel super wrapped that he got time to say goodbye and i feel happy and blessed that his friends and family got to come and see him even though he wasn't you know ken that they that they knew from even months ago at least they were still in his presence and he's theirs Whereas mum, I feel so sad for her that, you know, life was taken within a day or two days in terms of really her being aware, I feel, of what who was around her and her not being able to say goodbye, knowing her as a person and, and her character, I feel she would be looking down, kicking herself, going... Yeah, did get the opportunity to, to say goodbye to friends and family and, and, and friends and family didn't. I mean, they did. You know, people came in, you know, obviously her brothers and sisters came in to see her, but, yeah, you know, she's well and truly gone by that point in time. So, yeah, I feel I feel sorry for mum, you know, in that in that space. And then my brother, well, he, he made that decision for whatever reason and probably you know i think probably with all a lot of suicides i guess at that point in time when they make the decision i don't think they're thinking about the impact that it may have and that was his decision so you can't yeah what do you what do you do you can't do anything about it he'd actually gone to you know his mates beforehand and hung out for for dinner and a handful of hours you know so Maybe that was his way of saying goodbye at that point in time. It left us a note, a handful of words, but I guess he said goodbye and you know, it wasn't, wasn't our fault, but 
yeah, no, no reason in that sense, but yeah, different. You know, each each death, those three, completely different. You know, for probably people who were close to that person, and then yeah, just the death itself, unexpected, expected. You know, accepted, not accepted. You know, yeah, all completely diff- different in that space, and then my age. You know, eighteen to you know an unexpected death, but now I'm twenty odd years on, and then to dad being a known outcome, yeah, you just handle it. Why do you just grieve differently? I think. Mm. Is there anything else you'd like to add or share with us today? No, I mean, look, I touched on it earlier and. You know, on the passing of Dad, you know, Kirsten and I touching on, God, I wish there was a, you know, a one-stop shop where you could, you could look ahead and and foresee some of this to help your decision making, and you know, and then you know yourself reaching out, and I think it's a, you know, would not saying it just because I'm on the podcast, but it is, it's a, it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful idea, and it's required because. You know, yeah, I had experience in in deaths, not that I wanted to, but, you know, you don't have direction and and you're you're just sort of jumping and you're being told by others in the industry, particularly, I mean, the funerals for mum and dad were fantastic and and I wouldn't have changed a a thing, Um, but I could imagine people would make decisions that they would regret, regret in months or years to come based around who they went with in terms of a a funeral um, director and photos or stories or or how they would handle wills or like there is just it's such a minefield and there really isn't a location to to find out all of that in one portal or point and at the same time you're not in a mindset where you're going to go, I'm going to go and Google all of this. And you would just get lost anyway. And, you know, there is a clock that ticks between someone dying and having a funeral. So, yeah, there's a heap of decisions to make. So I think what you're trying to create is a is a really fantastic space for people you know particularly if they do get to plan or have a time to plan before someone passes you know via an illness or whatever if they've got time you know an an absolute wonderful resource for someone to delve into to prepare not always obviously going to have that that time and energy but before someone passes but even then I think if people were aware of here's a place where I can go and and search and just get some real quick an- quick answers or some referrals to other websites or organisations to help in whatever way they need. Yeah, I think I think you know, absolute, absolutely, it's required, and it's just not something that you think of when you're in the, you know, the the grief period of losing someone. You just got to pick yourself up and move into this other space of preparing for funerals and informing friends and family and then potentially packing up someone's life and managing that element so there's so much to it so no, i think it's a fantastic fantastic piece of work and uh, and i really hope it goes well <laughs> thank you james well thank you so much for your time today thanks Catherine. appreciate it we hope you enjoyed today's episode of don't be caught dead brought to you by critical info If you liked the episode, learnt something new, or were touched by a story you heard, we'd love for you to let us know. Send us an email. Even tell your friends. Subscribe so you don't miss out on new episodes. If you can spare a few moments, please rate and review us as it helps other people to find the show. Are you dying to know more? Stay up to date with Don't Be Caught Dead by signing up to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Head to don'tbecaughtdead.com for more information and loads of resources.